Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. This is episode number 496 for Wednesday, the 22nd of March, 2017. So good to have you here. I'm Robbie Ferguson. I am Sasha Dermatis. Tonight, we have a great plan for you. We're going to be learning how to expand the space of your Raspberry Pi. We've got one right over here. There it is, a retro Pi gaming system. We're going to add 128 of memory. Now, we're going to try, but we're going to tell you right off the get-go, right here at the beginning of the show, that we found as the show progressed that the SD card was corrupt. So instead, we're going to go through the process of learning some of the troubleshooting things that I do in order to uh, in order to figure out that that card was corrupted. We go through a couple of different things. We learn about things like IO top. Right. What else did we learn? Or, or, uh, sorry, time travel. What else are we going to learn tonight? We're going. Uh, You've got news stories. I have news stories. For example, we're going to learn all about audacious we're cyber gonna, criminals. Exactly. All right, here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Audacious cyber criminals have created a Star Trek themed strain of ransomware. Computers can lip read now. Ubiquity devices are vulnerable to takeover attacks with a single click. And many popular Android devices ship with malware, malware already installed. Stick around, the full details are coming up later in the show. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm your host, Robbie Ferguson. And tonight, would you help me welcome Sasha Dermatis? Hi, everyone. How's everybody doing? Last week, we had so much fun on episode number 495. And uh, we had a ton of kids here. If you haven't seen it yet, it was our March Break Family Special. Please check out the uh, episode at Category5.tv. It was episode 495. The kids had a blast. Uh, everybody left here with big smiles on their hearts and on their faces. And uh, it was a good time. Everybody had a great time. And we got a lot of views. We got a lot of likes. We appreciate your comments on YouTube and the encouragement for the kids. People just giving thumbs up and saying, that was awesome. You did a great job. Um, keep that coming because the kids, as you know, I mean, you show, uh, you, you, you come on a show like this as a child and you're going to be on the website refreshing and they're, wa they're watching for your positive uh, comments and, and everything like that. So um, keep it coming. And that uh, helps to encourage them. And the whole goal there was to really give them a, an amazing opportunity that they may not have had otherwise. They loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved it. They loved it. <laughs> they had a blast. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're still talking about it. My son, uh, Liam, the littlest one, uh, he, he's been going on about it. Everybody that we see is telling them about the show and we went to grandma and grandpa's on the weekend and he was telling them about his the the retro gaming system okay. with 200 games <laughs> oh and tonight speaking of retro gaming oh, sasha yes robbie well you remember we set up a retro pie back on episode number 442 and we've got it right here but one of the things that we found over the course of using it is mm -hmm. with a 32 gig S sd card um sd card um there's not a lot of space for game roms right especially when you realize retro pie does an amazing job of emulating uh, the Sony PlayStation. Right. And they've got good graphics, good gameplay, um, definitely, um, you know, tops as far as gaming on the RetroPie goes, but they take up a lot of space. So you might stick 10 of them on there and all of a sudden you've got a full card. So tonight um, we are going to actually learn how to increase the capacity of our RetroPie without reinstalling, without losing any of our settings. And uh, we're going to do so by adding another SD card. Now, you can also do this by um, uh, using a USB uh, flash drive. You can get right. the really, really low profile ones, which I would suggest, um, because then you're not going to risk, you know, when, when the game system is there, you don't want somebody to bump the I USB think. flash drive or knock it out while it's hot or something like that. That makes sense. Yeah. So the idea between, behind uh, micro SD right. is that they're very, very tiny, as you know. So what I picked up for you, Sasha, so we've got a 128 gig card that you actually picked up. Right. Right. So 128 gigs. Remember. Super tiny. Yeah, so, so tiny. <laughs> Can you even see it in my hand? Isn't that amazing? 128 gigs. So the card that's in your retro pie. Right. Because this is Sasha's, by the way, or it, should I say Dave's? It is Dave's gaming system mm -hmm. here, Dave's pie, but I am pretty happy because 
you know. You hooked him up and yeah. made it made it happen. Pretty so. yeah. Pretty okay. much I'm the one who shows it off to everybody. You've got a thirty two gig card in yes. in the system. That's what we built it on. Mm-hmm. And it runs fantastic. Lee. Fantastically, is that a word? Fan- yeah. Fantastically. Fantastically. I can make up things. Uh, and it's probably real. You can Google it. Um, but the thing is, is now you, you picked up the 128 gig and I thought, okay, well, I'll image the 32 gig mm-hmm. over to the 128 and I'll expand the file system and it'll all be good. But I ran into a lot of trouble, Sasha. It didn't work. It was not booting. It was having trouble. And, you know, it, the whole idea was to give more space to your right. RetroPie gaming system. It seemed like it would be really simple at first. It like sounds, in theory. Yeah, in theory, it sounds it, like something you can do pretty easily. Yeah. Now, if you're not familiar with RetroPie, it's a retro gaming system. Uh, and I've got one set up over here. I've got Sasha set up over here. So we've actually got a PlayStation game running on a Raspberry Pi microcomputer, okay? So there's no disks, there's nothing like that. It's just a ROM that, uh, that has been ripped from the original disk. Now, because we couldn't just install a larger capacity card. Right. Oh, and I was saying, check out episode number four, uh, what was it, 443? 442. 442, yes. Where we taught you about how to actually build this, okay? So if you're interested in building a retro gaming system, that's where you want to go, that's where you want to start, okay? So this is phase two. This is like number two of the series, we'll say. So the micro SD 128 gig wouldn't work as the host operating system for the RetroPie. Right. And I got thinking, and it, it, and it took me some thinking, mm-hmm. because I, I didn't see an answer online, and I, didn't, I, don't, I don't know that any, probably somebody has done this somewhere, but maybe not documented it in a video like we're doing tonight. Um, I thought, why don't we instead create a new hard drive inside the RetroPie operating system, expand it onto that using the ROM's mount point, and so all the games are going to go on this, but the operating system is going to remain on the 32 gig card. Right. Never been done before. This is all happening live on Category 5 Technology TV. So the operating system is going to have its own space to just like... The operating system is going to yeah. stay on the 32 gig card because we know it works great. Exactly. Games? But the games are going to be moved over to this. Right. Okay. Let's do it. So I got you this nice little low profile SD card adapter. We want low profile because we don't want something that's sticking out of the computer, out of the RetroPie uh, too right. far. Okay. So with this one, all I have to do is just insert the micro SD card into the USB end actually. <laughs> and then it becomes a little low profile, little thumb drive. Very okay. cool. But it's 128 gigs. It's a Kingston uh, micro SD card. They're super fast. They're super reliable. And uh, so all I need to do is just plug that in. Okay. So before I plug it in, I'm going to bring up the RetroPie on my computer screen. And I'm going to be able to actually show you uh, what I see there. So let's, uh, let's get to it. So here on my laptop, I've got uh, Ubuntu Mate. So I'm going to go into System Tools, Mate Terminal, and I'm going to go SSH, PI, at, and then the IP address of your uh, RetroPie. 192.168.0.101 is my RetroPie's IP address, or Sasha's. Right. This, this RetroPie is at that address. Yours is going to be at a different address. That's Basic Networking 101. If you're not sure how to find that, um, you can um, che- usually check your router, log in, look for the DHCP pools, and uh, look at the existing um, DHCP um, active clients, and you'll see RetroPie and then an IP address assigned to it. That's in your router because that's what gives it its IP. So on this RetroPie right now, this Raspberry Pi microcomputer, I have just a couple of things. I've got an HDMI output cable. This is the video and audio. I've got USB power, and I've got Ethernet. Now, typically on a RetroPie, we don't necessarily need to have Ethernet. That's networking or internet because they're retro games. They're not internet connected. But it can be used for updating it. It can be used to connect to it from another computer. And that's what I'm doing here by showing you how to SSH into it. So you do need to know your um, IP address. So mine's dot 101. So hit enter. Ask me for my password, which is raspberry. Make sure you spell it right. It does have a P in it, okay? Uh, now, sudo su is going to create a super user environment. That's going to give me the ability to, to work this thing without having to type sudo every time I do something crazy. So what we want to do is, it would see, we're in the slash home slash pi folder right now. So 
that's where I am. If I now go into CD RetroPie with a capital R, capital P, um, you're going to see a folder called ROMs. And if I go into ROMs, you're going to see a list of all the different systems that this system is capable of emulating. Okay, there they are. Now, within those folders, so if I go into the Sony PlayStation folder, you can see all the games that Sasha has in there. So, let's see how much room this is going to take, Sasha. Okay. DU-H. So, you're using 24 gigs, which is almost your entire micro SD. Right. And there's not a lot of room for the OS, and there's certainly not a lot of room to add more games. Right. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to get started on moving this because it's going to take some time. Okay, so... I've got your little flash drive that we've built from uh, a micro SD card. It can be a flash drive, but as I said, I like the low profile nature of this. You can get a low profile uh, USB thumb drive, but this is probably going to be a little faster. And that's because these are very, very fast micro SD cards. Okay. Uh, you can find very fast thumb drives like flash drives, but chances are pretty good they're going to have a, a larger profile. So now all I'm going to do is I'm just going to plug this directly into the RetroPie, aka Raspberry Pi, and now it's plugged in. So on my computer now, because I'm SSH'd into it, which is basically a remote terminal session, I can type fdisk-l and I can see um, three different devices. I've got MMCB LK partition one and partition two. So this is my actual micro SD. We know that because uh, this is the micro SD of, of RetroPie. Uh, it has a FAT16 partition, that's the boot partition, and then it has a Linux partition, which is RetroPie itself. And so this is most definitely my 128 gig uh, card. How can I confirm that? Well, of course, I can just unplug it. Okay, so now it's unplugged because it wasn't mounted. It's safe to do that. Uh, and then jump back to my computer and again type fdisk-l and you'll see that I only have those MMCBLK um, uh, drives connected mm -hmm. right now. So if I jump back again, plug it in, and this is just one way that you can see. And now that it's plugged in, if I do fdisk-l, I see SDA1 now exists. So I need to format it. I need to prepare it to be used for... Uh, a Linux system because RetroPie is powered by Debian Linux or um, Raspbian. So let's uh, let's hop back in here and we're going to go uh, make fs. So mkfs and we're going to do ext3. So we do dot ext3 and then we're going to go slash dev slash sda1. Now do keep in mind as we are doing this, this is 100% destructive. What I'm telling it to do is to create a new file system on that micro SD that I just plugged in uh, using the little thumb drive. If it has any data on it, you're going to lose it. Back it up first. Uh, if you're not sure if you are about to format the correct drive, you need to confirm that before you go any further. Further. Very, very important because this is a, an entirely destructive process. All right, so now that I know that this is the right one, I'm just going to run that. And it says it contains a file system already, uh, and it may say FAT32, it may say NTFS, whatever that drive was, uh, it might be XFAT, whatever it was formatted as. Do I want to proceed to convert it and format it to ext3? I'm going to say yes, and there it goes. <laughs> so this is wiping that 128 gig drive right. so that we can add it to the system. Let the games begin. Oh boy. Yeah, yeah. So that's going to take a little bit of time on the, uh, on the Raspberry Pi uh, because it is, you know, it's a microcomputer. It's not super duper fast. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have a game running right now. It might actually speed things up if I was to take my PS3 controller. And there we go. Uh, and let's exit that game. Good idea. Good idea? Yeah. All right. Does that make it go any faster? 76 of a thousand. We're going to speed this up through the magic of television. <laughs> now, everyone can get their own Pi at cat5.tv slash Pi. That's right. right. And then they would go ahead. Can you order RetroPi or would you have RetroPi is free. Yes. Uh, the ROMs, you would own your own uh, games or there are abandonware sites that have old ROMs. We don't oh. officially support those because, yeah. you know, it's a gray area, whether it's legal in your country or not is, you know, it depends on where you live. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, essentially, uh, if you have games and you can copy the ROMs over, that's one way. Uh, but there are sources for them as well. Super. 
Yeah, there we go. It took a little while. Now, we sped it up for uh, you viewing at home, but uh, that took a little while here in the studio. But uh, we got there. Um, so now that we've done that, now it's creating the journal. Oh, I spoke too soon. It's not <laughs> quite done yet. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, well, at least that moved fast. We're very, very... Okay, give yourselves a little bit of time, folks. <laughs> Don't do this live on the air or anything when like that. When you're doing it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so as that is happening, I can be doing other things on the pie. I would recommend that you don't do any gaming at that time because that's pretty heavy, right? But the one thing that I do want to do, and I can do this while this is wrapping up, is I want to close out of what's called Emulation Station because that is going to be tying up some of those files that we're going to be moving okay. onto this drive once, once it's done formatting. So in order to exit that, now I've got, uh, I've got your controller here. This is a PS3 controller? Yes. Yeah, and so it's connected by Bluetooth, uh, and we showed you how to do that on episode 420, uh, 442. 440, 442. 442. You've got to keep me yeah. in line here. Uh, so all I need to do is push the start and uh, select button at the same time to exit any game, uh, but the start button by itself is going to bring up the menu that allows you to quit. So I'm just going to scroll down to quit and then hit the button that is associated with my click, which is the square, and then go down to quit emulation station. Really quit, yes. And it's just going to be a black screen, uh, but that is going to now free up uh, the system so that emulation station is not using any of the files that we're about to move. All right, so how are we looking here? Almost there. It's writing the super blocks. This is done. It happened, Sasha. Yes. Now, once again, took a little bit extra time, real time, but we sped it up for you. Now, jumping over to um, the retro pie, you can see that it actually did go to a black screen and took me to uh, the bash prompt. Um, so that's cool. We're still SSH'd into the system, so I can do everything that I need to do from here. So we know what we want to achieve here, Sasha. We want to take all of these ROMs and move them onto SDA1. Right. Now, are we ready? Yes. We're going to get this started. This is going to take even longer. <laughs> so, what I want to do, well, I want to copy them, but I need to find out, first of all, um, you know, we're, we need to create a spot to put this. So, let's, let's just look at slash MNT. I'm not sure what's in there. It's empty. So, I'm going to go make dir slash MNT slash, and I'm going to call this SDA1. That can be whatever you want to call it. I could call it Harry if I wanted to. Uh, but note that I am super user, so I used sudo sue in order to become super user, so I didn't have to type sudo there. If you get a warning that you don't have permission, you probably forgot that step. So now we know that it's SDA1, so I'm going to type mount slash dev slash SDA1 and then to the mount point that I just created. Please don't mistake this SDA1 for anything that needs to... I could have, as I say, I could have called that Harry and then the command would have been Harry. Okay? That's just my mount point that I created. So SDA1. Uh, and it says wrong file system type, bad super block, missing code page, and so on and so forth. Let's see if I can specify the uh, file system. Linux file system. I think it was ext, yeah, ext3 is what I created. Uh, let's see, what am I missing? Let's get a quick boo. Oh, there's going to be a lot of editing tonight. <sighs> and so, you know, our troubleshooting step is, okay, what, what have I done? Uh, wrong FS type, bad option, bad super block. I mean, it is possible that it's a bad super block. That may be why I had trouble getting this disk to work. What's a super block? It's, it's, a, it's a block that is absolutely awesome. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. Shows the disk, it's all good. Bear with me, folks. 
Yeah, see, corrupt partition tables. But I just created the partition. It could be uh, it could be a bad disk. Wouldn't that suck? The new disk is a bad disk. It's possible. Maybe that's why I had trouble getting it to install the first time. Maybe that's why it never worked. Oi, oi. Mount should just do it. Right. Any thoughts in the chat room? So far, nothing. I'm hoping that somebody comes up with something. I like that. Debug FS. Neat. Well, let's see what D message says. F disk question mark fire up G parted. Error loading the journal. Mounting ext3 file system using the. Why is it using the ext4 subsystem? Oh, unrecognized. Uh, oh, it doesn't recognize the UID 1000, which is r root. Why is it trying to do it as an ext4? Maybe I just had the command wrong. <clears throat> Can't make this stuff up, folks. Did you forget the FAT32 switch when formatting? No, it's not FAT32. It's oh, doing okay. ext3. Oh, there and you so, go. And so I too, you know, I did the dash t for file system ext3. It oh, still okay. is trying to mount as ext4, which is very strange. Let me check it again. This is actually going to be a super great episode <laughs> after all of the editing. <laughs> Does your .deb operating system default to ext4? Well, I'm specifying in the mount that the mount is a ext3 file system. Okay. So I've specified that. Oh, okay. So, so that's if, not it. No, well, I don't think so because I am telling it to mount it as a ext3 file system. Okay. But yet, see, it's mounting mounting ext3 file system using the ext4 subsystem. What the heck is that? Aha! Could that be it? Well, it's definitely an error. Partition is mounted as ext3. It's just that ext3 file systems are handled by the ext4 drivers nowadays. Okay, so that's okay then. With this message, you see what they've when they've mounted. There used to be a separate ext3 driver, but it was dropped. When the ext4 driver had proven itself reliable, the ext4 driver checks that file system mounted as ext3 only use ext3 features so that they remain compatible with the old ext3 driver. Bloomin' heck! Is it possible SDA1 is a reserved word? No. No? Okay. It's an actual drive. Okay. In the dev assignments table. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I can't mount that drive. There's something here going on. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to throw that onto my laptop because it's going to be able to, I'm going to be able to remedy this a lot quicker if I plug it into a faster system. The RetroPie is, you know, the Raspberry Pi is a fairly slow system. Now, this is interesting. Error mounting. So, I wonder if there was something wrong when we formatted, something went wrong. So, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try, let's format it using this computer instead. So, I'm going to bring up gparted so that we can correct, um, so that we can correct this file system. Not sure what happened there. Uh, so let's uh, let's just say, okay, you may encounter some problems, and this is part of the troubleshooting process. But 
and I'm going to go into sudo gpart ed, which I already have installed. You can install it with your favorite package manager. Um, we can just say, I mean, we can say maybe it's better to do this, and it's a lot faster, obviously, to use <laughs> like your Linux laptop or Linux desktop computer to do, to do the actual formatting. I thought we could do it directly on the Pi, but unfortunately it didn't work tonight. So let's use gpart ed to now, it's, look at this. What is the flag that it's got there? Warning, file system volume name, none. Last mounted, never dynamic, has journaling. Journal super block magic number invalid. So something happened during the formatting process, I think, that caused this drive to have problems. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to delete what we did on the Pi. I'm going to create a new partition. Again, this is destructive. Be careful. I'm going to call this ext3 file system, and we're going to call this ROMs, and I can call that whatever I want. Watch how much faster this is going to be compared to formatting on my uh, Raspberry Pi itself. Now, right. please note, I, I'm moving a little too fast here. I want to slow it down just in case you have to go through this. Create, I've deleted the partition table up here. I'm going to create a new partition, and then I choose ext3 as the file system, and the label is going to be ROM. That's just for my own reference. So when I plug it into a computer, that's what I see. Sasha, we were talking about file systems. Look at all right. the ones that's, that Linux supports. There's oh, FAT16, wow. FAT32, HFS is uh, Linux, uh, Mac. Um, then we've got all these other ones that it supports. Right. But we're going to do uh, EXT3. Now, what would the difference be between EXT2, like, 3, 4? Like, what, is, what are the differences? Um, essentially, there? it's versioning, but they have, um, like, journaling means it's going to, and I don't want to get into this during this feature because okay. we're, it's a whole other topic, oh, but oops. journaling is like, it's, it gives a little bit of a redundancy so that if your power goes out, you don't necessarily lose the data that was being written at the time. Got um, it. It's helpful that way. Um, the, the way that the file systems work with different sized blocks. So um, if you have larger file sizes, ext3 works really well. Um, if you're working with a whole bunch of little files, then ext4 may be the choice. And it's all, you know, it's all, th there's so much to it. Okay. In our case, we're going to use ext3. It's a good, solid uh, Linux file system. And this is a Linux system, or RetroPie. So I've just created the new partition there, and I'm going to hit checkmark to approve. And then are you sure? This is going to lose all the data. Yep. Oh, we waited for the first go on the retro RetroPie. Look at how much faster this is. Just do it this Incredible. way, folks. Just do it, do it this yeah. way. Do it yeah. this way. Yeah. Yeah. Although, I mean, if you only had... No, I guess you... I was going to say, if you only had the Pi... As an option, yeah, you could well, use it, right? It didn't work, though. It didn't work at all. No, you can't use it. Do not use it. Don't maybe, do it that Maybe that's just, you know, that could be this particular disk <laughs> right. had a problem or it, who knows. But uh, I'm going to say, you know what? Use gpart ed. Yep. <laughs> it's, like the, it's like time has stood still. That's right. Wow. That's some good live TV there, folks. <laughs> do, do, do. We need to, like, put tumbleweeds across the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe like some special effects to make it look like it's on fire. Maybe. This is going to be a two-parter. You were hoping to take this home tonight. <laughs> oh, man. Maybe there's a problem with the SD card or carrier. Well, the, no, the, the, the card is suspect right now to me. Okay. The, uh, the ad adapter to turn it into a USB drive... I've used before, and it works fantastic. Oh. I actually used this particular device to create NEMS, so we know it's good. <laughs> I did that on a 32 gig card, though. Mm. So it, when you're in a situation like this, where it just seems like it's just standing still, yeah, I'm going to try seeing what my I.O. is doing. I.O. top is not installed. sudo su app get update. We're going to install IO top, which is going to be like, it's like top for the IO. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> App get install IO top. Let's just see if the computer is actually doing anything. Bob K54 said he's used an HP low level formatting tool on Windows to save cards with problems. <laughs> MakeFS EXT3 is using 99% of my IO right now. So that shows me that it is going. It is oh, okay. working. Oh, and, there, and it's, it's starting to move. 
It's like, oh, you're paying attention to me. See, so you, you see how this troubleshooting ability and just knowing what tools to use. So IOTOP showed me, yes, it is still working. It is still doing something. Because normal top shows you what's using CPU. Well, creating a file system is not going to use a lot of CPU. Right. It's going to use a lot of I.O. That's your interface, your input output. Mm -hmm. um, so the writing and reading from hard drives and things like that. So, so that's one way that you can just to detect, you know, is it still working? That's handy to yeah, know, right. actually. I think so. Because visually, I would have probably given up the ghost. Yeah, that's when people start right. closing things, and then you wonder why your disk is corrupt. Yeah. Because I thought it was frozen. It really wasn't. It was working with 100% of the I.O. saturated. So that means it was pushing it so hard that it, like, froze up. Right. So, okay. Excellent. So now it's creating the actual... Uh, the new file system within the new partition that it created. And it's also possible that things kind of locked up there because there was a problem when I formatted it on the Pi. So right. maybe there was some issue there. Uh, but we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll get to the bottom of that. I'm so. actually super excited about this. Mm. <laughs> super excited, but not super exciting. Right. The end result, this is one of those things that the end result is fantastic. And we're mm -hmm. looking at some really cool devices over the next little while where the end result is an out-of-the-box experience. But I, I had the discussion um, that, you know, sometimes it's fun to just play and just, you know, you pick up a, a, a Pi, a Raspberry Pi at cat5.tv slash Pi. And thank you to those of you who have done so. It's, uh, it's one of our top sellers. Uh, we can do so many different projects with this. So mm -hmm. we're building, you know, we've got a retro gaming system and it takes time. Sure, it's taking us time to do this tonight uh, and it's filling up the hour like that, but it's a lot of fun and it feels good to be able to say, you know, when my nephew comes over and they play RetroPie, to be able to say, oh, I built that. Right. He's like, what? Like, how did you get all these Nintendo games on a, a PS3 controller? So we're all sitting down there with PS3 controllers playing old NES games. Yeah. So, you know, how, how's that done? It's something that you can't just go out and buy. It's, it's not, you know, but you can, and then you can do it yourself. Yes. And just enjoy doing it. It's so. super satisfying. It might be a bit of work to begin with, but it's super satisfying. A little bit. Boy, oh boy. That is, it, it, maybe it's a brutal card. I don't know. No, it's it's working away. It's working. It's doing its thing. Yeah. It's taking it easy. Boy, oh The good boy. thing is I don't even know what I don't know in this. So I don't even understand how complicated it actually is. I'm just like, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. It's probably fine. <laughs> I hope you can follow the steps and <laughs> go for it. It's still yeah. creating this file system, folks. Wow. Not... <laughs> Tonight, we're going to be showing you how to format an SD card two different ways. Today, we'll be practicing our patience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. Well, I'm going to take another sip of my coffee. Well, that is taking an astronomical amount of time to format this card. Mm -hmm. Not quite what we expected tonight. We didn't expect that this is going to become a seven-part miniseries, but... I know you've got news stories. Yes. We want to cover them tonight. And as we're kind of waiting here for this to happen, um, before we do get into the news, though, yes. can I just say congratulations to Chris Lee? <gasps> yes. Uh, his baby boy was, uh, was just born. Uh, his name was... Welcome to the world, Jaden. Jaden. I was yes. going to say Jaden. I just wanted to make sure. Yes. Welcome to the world. And congratulations, Chris. He's one of our viewers and uh, a regular on Twitter to, to say hi. Uh, and uh, yeah, big congratulations. Right. All right, you ready to get into it? I certainly am. All right. Here are the stories we're covering this week in the Category 5.tv newsroom. Audacious cyber criminals have created a Star Trek themed strain of ransomware. Computers can lip read now. Ubiquity devices are vulnerable to takeover attacks with a single click. And many popular Android devices ship with malware already installed. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. Now here's another great way you can support the shows you love from the Category 5.TV network by shopping at GearBest. That's right, Jeff. Uh, Cat5.TV slash GearBest. It's an online store for the geek streak in you. Or the loved ones. Well, of course. I mean, especially your loved ones, right? Uh, because Cat5.TV slash GearBest, quite frankly, has all of the greatest tech gifts 
that you could ever hope for at rock bottom prices. Do they have cell phones? You betcha. Cat5.tv slash GearBest has a wide assortment of unlocked Android cell phones and tablets. What about compute, uh, consumer electronics? Those make a great gift. Absolutely. From high-tech watches to action cameras, headphones, even virtual reality headsets. Cat5.tv slash GearBest has you covered. They literally have it all, Jeff. Literally. Really? It's like a superstore right from the comfort of your own chair at your computer through the interweb. Yeah. I, there's no way they have it all. It's true. It's just a bunch of ele- uh, random electronics. Test me. Um, what about clothes? Yep. Both men and women, fashionable apparel at rock bottom, super duper prices. Kind of like this. Well, look at this coat. What do you think? It's a slimming mock leather jacket. I love it. It's available for less than $30 plus free shipping at cat5.tv slash gear best. All right. You kind of got me there. Wow. Any other questions for me, Jeff? Uh, Now that the winter has passed, flying season. Do they have any good deals on, say, drone copters? Oh, my goodness. Well, check this out. Dude, they have everything. Check out over 500 various drones. And not only that, they're available marked down by about 30 to up to 63% off the regular price. Love it. What's the website again? Well, you're going to find GearBest on our partners' pages for any of your favorite Category 5 TV shows like New Every Day, Category 5 Technology TV, The Pixel Shadow. Uh, But of course, if you want to shop absolutely right now and you want to go straight to the site, all you have to do is visit cat5.tv slash GearBest. See, that's easy. Cat5.tv slash GearBest. That's right. Happy shopping. I'm Sasha Dermatis, and here are the top stories for the week of March 22nd, 2017. Audacious cyber criminals have created a Star Trek themed strain of ransomware. Hat tip to Bleeping Computer, which broke the story on the Kirk malware discovered Thursday by Avast malware researcher Jacob Krusek. The software disguises itself as the notorious Low Orbit Ion Cannon, LOIC, denial of service tool, a utility beloved by anonymous hacktivists back in the day before everyone realized it revealed IP addresses of users. Kirk is reckoned to be the first ransomware to utilize Monero rather than Bitcoin as the ransom payment of choice. The malware decryptor Spock will be supplied to the victim once the payment is made, but at this time, the ransomware does not look like it can be decrypted. Anti-malware firm Reboot reports. Right now, there are no known victims of the ransomware and there is no sample of the decryptor, so information regarding it is limited. The decryptor is said to be promised once the ransom is paid, but obviously there are no guarantees and it cannot be decrypted at present without it. For the first two days, crooks are demanding 50 Monero, or roughly $1,072. The fee doubles every few days if the victims fail to cave. If no payment is made by the 31st day, the decryption key gets permanently deleted, according to the ransom note. So this is one of those just really sad stories where people are, are just, again, ransomware, but instead of Bitcoin, using Monero, still taking your money, still stealing, stealing your stuff, making false promises. <laughs> Horrible. <laughs> okay. Scientists at Oxford say they've invented an artificial intelligence system that can lip-read better than humans. The system, which has been trained on thousands of hours of BBC news programs, has been developed in collaboration with Google's DeepMind AI division. Watch, Attend and Spell, as the system has been called, can now watch silent speech and get about 50% of the words correct. That might not sound too impressive, but when the researchers supplied the same clips to professional lip readers, they got only about 12% of the words right. June Sun Chung, a a doctoral student at Oxford University's Department of Engineering, explained words like bat, mat, and pat all have similar mouth shapes. It's context that helps his system, or indeed a professional lip reader, to understand what word is being spoken. He explains what the system does is to learn things that come together, in this case the mouth shapes and the characters and what the likely upcoming characters are. 
a lot more work needs to be done before the system is put to practical use, but the charity Action on Hearing Loss is enthusiastic about using this latest advance. They believe that a lip reading system could be used to supplement existing speech to text to further improve accuracy. Just one of those good news stories. All right, security researchers have gone public with details of an exploitable flaw in Ubiquiti's wireless networking gear after the manufacturer allegedly failed to release firmware patches. Essentially, if you can trick someone using Ubiquiti gateway, a Ubiquiti gateway or router to click on a malicious link or embed the URL in a web page they visit, you can inject commands into the vulnerable device. The networking kit uses a web interface to administer it and it has a zero C CSRF protection. This means attackers can perform actions as logged in users. A hacker can exploit this blender to open a reverse shell to connect to a Ubiquiti router and gain root access. Yes, the built-in web server runs as root. The researchers claim that once inside, the attacker can then take over the entire network. And you can thank a very outdated version of PHP included with the software. The, virgin, the version is found to, found to be in use in the devices in is 2.0.1 from 1997. The whole attack can be performed via a single GET request. The system found the security hole in four Ubiquiti devices and believes another 40 or so models are similarly vulnerable. The affected models include, but are not limited to, the Tough Switch TS8 Pro, Rocket M5, Pico Station M2HP, and Nano Station M5, plus various air fiber and air gateway models, power beam devices, and light beam boxes. In response to the exploit being revealed, Ubiquiti says that they have released updates that resolve the issue for 37 out of the 44 products affected. They say they are also very close to releasing another update for the remaining seven products mentioned in the report and will send a newsletter once they're done. So they are working on it currently. <laughs> All right. Keeping malware off of your mobile device should be a top priority for anyone who purchases a new smartphone or tablet. But what if the battle against bad actors has been lost before you even open the box? That's exactly what security firm Checkpoint is, says is happening right now, and it just released a report claiming that it detected malware on 36 different Android devices being used by multiple large tech companies. The devices on which the malicious code was detected are thought to have been compromised at some point between manu manufacturing and eventual sale to the end user. Checkpoint's mobile threat prevention team explains in a blog post, the malicious apps were were not part of the official ROM supplied by the vendor, adding that the malware must have been added somewhere along the supply chain. In their investigation, the devices that were shown to have pre-installed malware come from many different manufacturers. They include Galaxy Note 2, 3, 4, 5, and 8, Asus Zenfone 2, LG G4, Nexus 5 and 5X, and Show Me Me 4i, and read me. For better or worse, the malware found to be installed on the devices is fairly well known in mobile security circles and includes Loki, a malicious advertising bot, and Slocker, which uses the Tor network to send data back to its creator while avoiding detection. This is obviously a very serious situation, and it's certainly not the first time Android devices were found to have security issues right out of the box. Scary stuff. All right. Thanks for watching the Category5.tv newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And for more free content, be sure to check out our website. From the Category5.tv newsroom, I'm Sasha Dermatis. Thanks, Sasha. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and you'll find our website at Category5.tv. Now, what we've learned tonight, we've learned a lot, but one of the things that we've learned is that in live broadcasting, it's not always going to go absolutely to plan. Right. But I've got good news. The format has completed. Okay, so during the news there, um, this all finished up, and I plugged it in 
to the retro pie and mounted it and everything went the way that it should have the first time. So mount dash T EXT three dev SDA one MNT SDA one. Okay. Now LS MNT SDA one. And you see that the lost and found is there. I have a working file system. So something went wonky during the format when it was plugged into the pie. Right. I don't know what it was. And uh, rather than diagnosing that, we just reform out of the disk again, mm -hmm. and it worked. Okay, so now that we've got that there, we can kind of pick up our, our uh, where we were, mm -hmm. and we can start copying our ROMs, our games, over to that new disk. Perfect. That's the important step. Um, so we're going to copy them so that this is kind of a redundant thing, so that if anything goes wrong, we still have them in the ROMs folder on the other, uh, other disk. Right. Okay. So let's hop back over here, and I'm going to do that. Here we go. So the command we're going to use is called CP for copy. And remember, we've now mounted this drive at SDA1, and we have all of our ROMs here at uh, Home, Pi, Retro, Pi, ROMs. So CP dash... R is for recursive, and lowercase p is for uh, preserve um, your permissions, the uh, file permissions and ownerships and all that kind of stuff. So cp space dash capital R, lowercase p, and then the source folder, which is going to be home pi retro pi, with a capital R, capital P, slash ROMs. Now, it's important that we remember to include a trailing slash. We don't want to copy the folder ROMs, we want to copy the content of ROMs. So that's why that trailing slash is important. And then we're going to copy it to slash MNT slash SDA1 and then hit enter. And there it goes. So it looks like it's doing absolutely nothing. But if I go system, Mate terminal, and let's connect again to the Pi. Uh, SSH pi at 192.168.0.101. So I'm creating a second session. And I can do my password is raspberry. Now if I go into slash MNT slash SDA1, while this terminal on the left is copying the files, this one shows that they are here. It's working that I.O. like crazy. <laughs> boy, oh boy, we're just pushing that, eh? There, it's finished. <laughs> Listing. Oh, and I've got the ROMs folder. <laughs> what did I do? I included... Oh, come on. This has just been fraught with peril, hasn't it, Sasha? <laughs> it has. I can add a, an asterisk. Let's do that. So where I want the asterisk is right here. Okay. And now, before I do that, I'm going to remove that folder that I created there accidentally. Because I don't want it to actually be in a ROMs folder. I want it to be in the root. So our, uh, I need to go sudo rm dash r and F, and be careful with this command, ROMs, and I'm doing this in mount SDA1. Very important that you make sure you're in the right folder. Okay, so that's going to remove the one that I accidentally put in there. And with the star here, see that star? That's going to instead grab the contents of this folder, and that should do. And I'm just going to control C just to see if that worked before we go through the whole process and find that SD cards are notoriously slower than like a hard drive or something like that, so do keep that in mind. The more that I, you know, work this thing, uh, the slower, you know, it becomes. Now, interesting thing. Okay, so we've been having some trouble here tonight. We have been having some trouble here tonight that is unexpected. This feature should really go very well. Mm -hmm. And I think that we've actually, we've just encountered what the problem is. Oh, what is it? We've got error messages on the screen here. Okay. That show device SDA1 block bitmaps. Invalid block bitmap. I think we've got a bad SD card, Sasha. Oh. Uh. Uh. It's not a Kingston card. 
I lied. <laughs> I wish it was a Kingston card now, because now I'm kicking myself. Well, hey, we're going to have to do this feature again, Sasha. And That's this right. whole show has been all about just troubleshooting problems and realizing right. that, my goodness, crapper doodles, we've got a bad SD card, and uh, that's not going to work. So, I do have Kingston SD cards. I do have a 128 gig. You bought a SanDisk card, and I don't promote SanDisk. <laughs> and so that's why I said it was a Kingston card, because I'm, you know, this is supposed to go well. And we're promoting Kingston, because those are the cards that we use and, and love. But there you have it. Bad blocks. Bad that's blocks. Why it, that's why it took so long. We've got a bad SD card. That's what it is. Sorry, folks. Hmm. What do you do? Well, this is troubleshooting. This is, yeah. this is live TV. And next week, we're going to have an amazing feature where it's going to go absolutely perfectly because we're going to use a Kingston card. Right. Plain and simple. It's going to go very we well. Go. I think that, you know, uh, there's value in the troubleshooting process. And, and so it, and mm -hmm. where this episode falls flat is we're not going to use this as a feature for the Raspberry Pi, obviously. Right. Because we had problems. But you learned some troubleshooting capabilities. You learned about IOTOP. You learned about you know, the process that I go through a little bit and how to reformat using uh, various different ways. But, and I think there's value in that. Mm -hmm. But I think also next week when we, when we tr try this again, because this is going to be a fantastic feature, and I'm really looking forward to doing this. And Dave is going to love it. You're going to love it. Mm -hmm. You're going to be able to do a one-to-one -one comparison of the two processes. So if it goes perfectly well with, a, with the Kingston card next week, then, then it's, that's fantastic. And I'm not lying to you. This is really what happened. There's the card. Can you see that, Sasha? I can. Can you read it? No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's tiny. Yeah. It's clearly not a Kingston. SanDisk Ultra 128 gigabyte. Not to bash SanDisk, but brand new card. And I want it to be a Kingston because I, I know that it's going to work really, really well with a Kingston card. So that's why I didn't, that's why I wasn't able to, I've spent so much time monkeying with this thing. Mm -hmm. and that's the problem. Aww. Wow. So yeah, next week you're going to get the full comparison of, you know, how, how should this go? How should this look? And uh, how should your SD card perform? We're going to be able to see too if maybe the formatting process being so slow was partially because of, um, because of the card. Right. Although here tonight, if you're watching on demand, you saw you you saw that sped up, but know that it took a lot longer. And those who are watching live, comment below and uh, share that you know that was that was a pretty brutal process. Mm -hmm. So you handled it well, Robbie. Can't they can't always be uh, knocked out of the park, folks? But it's always fun having you here, and, and I do appreciate each and every viewer and uh, your support as well. Um, people have been using our, our affiliate links, and, uh, and, and that helps us to pay the bills and, and helps us to you know, keep the rent paid and everything, because we're volunteers here. And, and so that, you know, we kind of are here with you and trying to put on a good show for you and trying to, to teach you some stuff, uh, which right. doesn't always go perfectly, but it's okay. And that, that happens. So. There's a valuable lesson to learn in that. I think that it doesn't always go as planned, no matter what. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. But you know what? Um, last week was so crazy hectic. This week, it, it was fun just to hang out and play and, and mess around with a broken SD card. Next week is going to be amazing because we're going to do it. Is that okay? That's great. Sorry, bud. That's all right. That's okay. The other lesson here is that when you're tech friend says oh, i've been having trouble getting this thing to go <laughs> it's possible they're not lying that this is the real deal and this mm -hmm. is you know these are the problems that we sometimes run into um not the pie's fault not the uh not retro pie's fault um may, maybe not my fault but just a faulty card sort of my fault then not your fault sort of my fault got damaged in transit you go. Well, hey, check out our website, category5.tv. I promise you there are some episodes there where things went really, really well. <laughs> and uh, you're going to learn a lot if you visit our website and check out what we have to offer. So thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you have a great week. See ya. Bye.